Hi, this is uh, Stian Hawklev, and this is the final presentation for week four. I posted some videos and uh, some readings on Monday, and I did a conversation with Leslie Chan on Wednesday, and I'm going to just sum up some of the points that we've gone through, and also some of the topics that have come up in the online discussion forum today. So the topic is knowledge production and consumption in the digital world supposed to say there and of course this is a, a huge topic and um, I'm only going to be able to touch the surface today um, but I thought that in fact this topic can be boiled down to uh, three really simple questions of course the answers are anything but simple um, but at least this is one way of structuring kind of the idea now there are lots of other questions we could have asked here. For example, what information is available? But if you look at a, an individual person, um, you could ask who is able to distribute information? Um, who is able to access information? And who is able to attract attention to their information? Um, these are kind of three fundamental questions. and. Uh, the readings and the videos that I posted all deal with these questions um, in various ways, and I really hope that you've had a, a chance to look at them. So if we have a look at these questions, you know, if you think about someone um, living in a developing world, or perhaps it's someone living in uh, the Canadian North, or someone in Toronto um, with very low income or low education level, so what could their obstacles to accessing information be? Well, uh, language is certainly a big barrier, right? Uh, you are constrained, usually, to accessing information in the language or languages that you speak. And uh, if you speak English, you might feel that um, that's a real benefit to you and that you have access to an incredible amount of information. Of course, there's still uh, many things that you might not be able to access. Um, uh, a, f a few years ago, when I was TA for this course, some students wanted to do a project on tuberculosis in northern China. And because they were Chinese, they were able to access a huge amount of government reports and research reports and uh, media, um, mass media, uh, articles about this problem that were not able uh, available in English and you know the same will be the case around the world so certainly only speaking English um, it doesn't give you access to everything but uh, on many fundamental topics you will be able to find information in English um, if you speak another of the large global languages uh, you might also be in luck uh, but sometimes there are surprises um, and especially in colonial countries where perhaps a language is spoken by a large proportion of the population, but where English or French or Portuguese is the language used by uh, publishers, by the education industry, it might still be difficult. So a good example is Hindi, which is spoken by 600 million people in India, um, and yet the internet, um, although growing, rapidly, still has a lot less information available in Hindi than you would expect. Um, even if you go to some official government websites, um, sometimes information will only be available in English. So language is clearly, um, and, and you know, that's Hindi, but if we talk about someone who only speaks uh, maybe a much, much smaller language, um, Icelandic is spoken by 300,000 people. So if you only speak Icelandic and no English, that would clearly be a big barrier for you. Um, access to a device, right? So I put printed material there because obviously much of our access to information um, still goes through printed material. And uh, that's even more so the case in, in uh, many developing countries where, for example, libraries um, are very important. Um, but this uh, course is mainly about information technology. So we'll be assuming that you need some kind of a device to access the internet. 
And in the West, that's often a um, computer, but more and more often it's a tablet computer. It might be a, a mobile phone or a smartphone, like the iPhone or an Android device. And in you know many parts of Africa, uh, people will typically access information through their cell phones. Um, this might device might not belong to you. Uh, you could once again access it through uh, a library, um, a telecenter, uh, or an internet cafe, or even at, in a friend's house at a workplace, and so on and so on. Um, now, having the device um, will not do you that much good unless you have access to the internet. There are some big projects um, to try to provide offline access to information. Um, for example, there's the project called the eGranary, which um, provides a hard drive, I think it's a, like a gigabyte or um, several gigabytes of compressed um, scientific articles, uh, you know, encyclopedias, all kinds of useful information um, that was designed specifically to be installed in, for example, a library in, in, a, in a developing world country and um, thus give the computers connected to that hard drive access to this information even without the internet. So there are, um, you know, um, attempts at, at, at doing that, but uh, as internet access thankfully is becoming more and more widespread and available, it's clearly a much more flexible um, way of doing things because otherwise you have to think ahead of time what kind of information should be included. Um, you have huge problems with updating the information and so on. Ability to use technology is, is uh, obviously, you know, uh, an important factor as well. And, uh, and this isn't a simple yes or no question. There are many people who are able to uh, type a letter on a computer or click on some links, but they might not have very sophisticated uh, strategies for searching the internet, they might not know about um, different programs, uh, uh, they might not know how to open certain files and so on. Then the, you know, the cost of material, we kind of often assume that everything on the internet is free. We're so used to being able to click on a link and immediately gain access to everything uh, that we're looking for. and that's not entirely true. In fact, a, a huge uh, swath of the internet is locked away in databases, in websites that require you to pay or be a member. Um, the reason, for example, why you cannot easily access um, many of the online journals that you need for your studies when you're at home as opposed to at school is because, and you have to use some um, you have to log in through the library website is because University of Toronto pays millions of dollars per year for access to those journals. And needless to say, if you're, um, if you're not part of University of Toronto, if you're not part of a very rich institution, uh, it will be very difficult for you to get access to that material. And uh, there's even a website which block your access based on where you're from. Um, so for example, uh, Google China has a great music service um, where you can listen to almost any song uh, that you want international and Chinese for free and it only works in China. <laughs> if you're in Canada, it will say, sorry, you cannot use this service. Uh, and that's something that's becoming more and more widespread, especially as the companies that produce content um, typically want to be able to have different deals for different countries. So let's say a producer of a movie might sell the rights to distribute in Canada for to one company and the rights to distribute it in the US to another company. And of course, that makes no sense if anyone in the world can access it on the same website. So therefore, the people in Canada might set up a website that only Canadians can visit. I mean, Netflix is a great example where people uh, in Canada get access to far fewer movies than, than users in the US. And then the latest, uh, the last one that I added was the ability to understand. So, you know, apart from the language issue, um, 
it's clearly not the case that anyone can um, download a scientific article and and be able to understand what it says. Uh, even for people who are in the university, you know, if, if it's in another field, if I download an article about um, high energy physics, it will not be very meaningful to me. And so I depend on other people to simplify it and to explain it for me to be able to access that um, information. Um, I'm sure there's uh, many other obstacles to access and uh, if you think of some maybe you could post them in the discussion forum but uh, these are some of the key key challenges um, perhaps. Now there are of course many attempts at alleviating these challenges uh, one of the problems that I mentioned was the devices and of course traditionally uh, computers have been very costly um, which is one of the reasons why cell phones have been so um, popular uh, and been so widespread. One reason is that they're, that they're cheaper, another is that they run on battery and they're portable and so in uh, many places where you don't have re reliable electricity for example uh, such devices are much uh, more appropriate. Um, this is a device that was announced just a few days ago um, based in um, from a Montreal company that uh, wanted to create a device that was very very low cost and could be used by Indian school children and they based it on the open source um, Android system from Google and apparently the tablet costs only $45 which is quite amazing of course you know it's uh, much cheaper um, kind of components than the iPad for example or you can't compare it but um, you know for $45 you could buy maybe two two three books of course more in India but it, it's a very low cost and, and imagining that through this device you would be able to access millions of, of books and, and uh, videos and so on, it, it's quite an astounding um, opportunity. And of course, um, there are many, still many questions. Um, the previous uh, very famous project to um, create a device that was specifically designed for, um, for school children in the developing world was called the OLPC or the $100 PC. And uh, that has been criticized quite widely, although it has been deployed in some countries and there are some reports that it's been successful, but um, that's certainly uh, one area that we could look quite critically on and uh, question some of their assumptions. So anyway, while of course these kind of specialized devices um, keep being made, the companies are also constantly innovating to produce uh, consumer gadgets that are that are more and more capable and available at, at lower and lower costs. Internet access is another huge issue and as Leslie um, mentioned during our conversation on Wednesday um, oftentimes it will actually be far more expensive to connect to the internet in um, for example some African countries than it will be in Canada and uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one of them has been that there was simply very little bandwidth available um, and uh, there this is um, in the process of being alleviated um, you see all these um, colored bands here are actually C cables uh, so very very high uh, high speed C cables that are laid outside the coast of Africa and you see these little links here which connect um, the cables into the country. Uh, this shows both uh, cables that are um, uh, completed and a few, especially the, the thickest ones, the, you see the, uh, the three thickest ones here, the lilac, the orange and the green are all in the process of being built and you see them far thicker than the quite thin cables that already exist. And uh, so that will, will have a huge impact, but of course, um, just having such a huge cable coming into your country is not enough. Um, it's often quite difficult to, to bring that into the different local areas and into the actual consumers. Um, but 
you know, luckily this is uh, an area that is in rapid change. Talking about language again is quite interesting, and and I love to use Wikipedia as an example because it's this uh, source of knowledge that exists in more than two hundred languages, and uh, this is an article about Norway, which is where I'm from, uh, written in Hindi. So this is the language I mentioned to you, spoken in India, with more than 600 million people who speak it. Um, now, sadly, because of the low literacy rate in India, um, only about 60% of those uh, users are actually literate. Um, and of course, out of those, um, most most of them might not have access to computers um, and so on. But either way, uh, what you see here is the article about Norway and, and it's two sentences, um, which, you know, I know I'm coming from a small country, but I do hope that there's a little bit more to say about it than two sentences. Um, so that's clearly, you know, a big a barrier. If you are um, a person in India who doesn't speak English and Although English is an official language, only about 10% of the population uh, speak English. So if you don't speak English and you would like to uh, use the internet to learn more about Norway, um, then clearly you are going to run into trouble. Um, on the other hand, um, sometimes Wikipedia can be a real support to languages, uh, minority languages. Uh, and this is an article about... Um, a previous prime minister in Norway, and it's uh, written in Lapish, which is the language of the northern ethnic minority in Norway. And although there are some news broadcasts in Norway in Lapish, um, it's a language that probably is not very well represented on the internet. And uh, so the fact that Wikipedia provides this uh, community um, and people have come together and collaboratively created this large knowledge resource in Lapish um, has done, you know, probably ma made a huge impact on, on people who speak those languages. Um, and in fact, I often say that I think the English Wikipedia in some sense, even though it gets the most publicity, is the least um, important Wikipedia. Because even though it's so large, it's the largest Wikipedia, but the fact is that even if Wikipedia were to cease existing tomorrow, people who speak English would not have a problem finding information online. Yet, for example, people who speak Lapish, um, if Lapish Wikipedia went away, they might lose 50% of all the internet pages in Lapish. And so in, in that specific sense, um, Wikipedias in, in these uh, smaller languages might actually have much more significance to their users. Um, another take on the language issue is looking at automatic translation. And while it's very far from perfect, it has actually come a quite a long way. And Google Translate is, is an example of this. Uh, this is my Google Reader, which you might know. You can uh, add a number of blogs here, and then you can easily follow them. And here's one um, blog that I follow about open science in Eastern Europe. Um, what might be what might be surprising to you is that if I click on the link here uh, to read more about these Polish Digital Libraries Conference um, and go to the original blog, um, you'll see here that the blog is written entirely in Polish. Um, and when I added this blog to Google Reader, it asked me if I wanted it to be automatically translated, and I said yes. So every time they post a new update, it shows up in my Google Reader already translated. And as I said, while it is not perfect, um, it still lets me quite easily keep up to date with what's happening um, in a way that I could never do have done otherwise. And so um, I think... Uh, it's actually quite amazing what, what's possible today. Um, so I talked quite a bit about obstacles to um, accessing information. And when it comes to obstacles to distributing information, um, it's actually very similar. Because one of the things that the internet has done, um, you know, it's a two-way medium. It's very different from a TV or a radio where you can easily receive information and you cannot very easily contribute. 
with, as long as you're able to somehow connect to the internet and of course the, the barriers of technology and uh, and so on still apply um, you can basically quite easily um, set up a blog add to a wiki page and so on so getting some information out there is very easy today however the the larger problem might be how do you get people to read it right um and and the arab uh spring has been an interesting case of that where uh people have been posting videos they've been posting blogs but it was perhaps uh only when when for example al jazeera begin to to um uh distribute this and of course then western media also began uh, reporting on this that most of you um, became aware of it and uh, in fact there are um, several crises going on around the world where there's lots of, of information being posted on the internet but it's probably not showing up on your radars at all so you know the information is out there um, if you go looking for it you'll find it um, yet it's not um, reaching you and it's not affecting you um, it has no, you know, so usually when people put out information, they have some purpose with it. And in many, you know, cases, they might try to gain it, gain the attention of the world. And yet, um, this is quite difficult. So, uh, even Zuckerman talks about, for example, how uh, the funding for foreign news reporting has been, um, been cut uh, many uh, foreign correspondents have have lost their jobs and there's a much actually smaller percentage of the news um, both in the newspapers and in the cable channels devoted to foreign news now than than you know 10 or 20 30 years ago which is is funny thinking that uh, before you might have had only half an hour of, of evening news every day and now we have these 24 hour news channels and yet they seem to only talk about the U.S. and the same few foreign countries, um, such as Iraq and Afghanistan, and and yet there are so many international stories that, that that we never hear about. So you know that's one problem. But then, of course, the the news um, papers could argue people aren't interested, and we have to give them what they want because they're paying for us or they're watching you know they, they choose which channel to watch so you know there's a question of how do you make people interested right if you i mean if you open the newspaper and it says new president elected in mali uh, which is an african country would you read that article um would it you know do you feel like it affects your life and how could it affect your life how could the newspaper make that article interesting to you or how could other things maybe you saw a, a film from that country maybe you're you have a friend from that country um, but how do you make people interested in in what's going on around the world um, Ethan Zuckerman also talks about these ideas of uh, homophilia or xenophilia and homophilia in this context just means that you like things that are similar to yourself so if you're for example uh a liberal in the u.s then you would read um, the huffington post and you would certainly not watch um the fox news right if you're a, a xenophile you might actively seek out points of view that are different from from the ones you have and you might actually seek out news from different cultures um you, you would be you say oh I would like to know more about the presidential election in Mali and of course and while maybe not all of us can be xenophiles some xenophiles can play the role of bridges and and this Ethan Zuckerman talks about these bridge bloggers right so um, if you if you you can explain to people why they should care and you can you can kind of bring uh, things to their attention now the two last points are, are also fascinating uh, this idea of credibility of information and where it's posted uh, you know traditionally if i po publish something 
uh, in a small local newspaper or I publish something in, in the New York Times, the one of the key differences would be that very much fewer people would be able to read um, the article in the local newspaper. Um, they just wouldn't physically be able to buy it unless they were probably living in that little town. Mm. Today, if you publish something on your own blog or you publish it on the New York Times, in fact, it's equally easy for someone who knows the URL to find it. There's absolutely no difference. Anyone, uh, some person in an Indian village who has that device for $45 that we just looked at could get go and read your, your, your blog just as easy as they can go to the government of India's website. So suddenly there is this equality. And yet, of course, there is a huge difference between appearing on uh, the New York Times website and, and, and having something on your own blog or on the website of a local newspaper. Um, one thing is, is of course, um, how many people come across it. Um, it might, uh, the New York Times article might or might not appear higher in Google search, which is something that's very important to a lot of people. And once they actually see it, let's see that let's say that someone Googles and they find two articles. One is from New York Times and one is from a local newspaper. Um, even though the information might be similar, will they trust the one that's posted in the New York Times more? Um, and a good example of an interesting example of that is uh, looking at these lectures on YouTube. So MIT has posted, um, a lot of their courses um, for free and you can go and watch the whole lectures. But what's really interesting is that um, the Indian Institutes of Technology have also done the same. And of course, in the past, you know, whether you wanted to study at MIT or at the university in India was uh, not just a, a simple matter of comparing which one was the best, but it was also a matter of actually moving to the US and, and uh, and you know it's not something that you could you a decision that you could take very lightly whereas here we're in a situation where anyone who wants to study for um for their exam can through a click of a button choose whether they want to watch this video from india or this video from mit and in fact we see um that the video from india has slightly more views on youtube uh, which is funny um so you know the question is will people who watch who see the one from mit automatically assume that it's better because MIT has such a reputation. Anyway, uh, there are, as you can understand, um, a lot of interesting um, discussions that could be uh, pursued in this in this regard. And many of these discussions will be returning to us as we go through the course. Um, and we also hope that you might um, pick up on some of these um, and uh, pursue them on the discussion forum or maybe in your other courses, and uh, we'd love to discuss them with you. So thank you for um, the attention, and uh, make sure you do all the readings, uh, participate in the forum, and uh, look forward to talking to you next week.